Oops. All right, so sorry. I didn't realize I'd already hit record. So a uh, little bit of overview of what I did uh, in class the past two days. Um, some of you uh, haven't gotten this yet. Some of you have uh, because half of you have taken the topic two test. Half of you haven't and we've gone over this. So I'm just recording this for everybody. Um, for topic four, because uh, for those of you that have taken topic two test, you'll be taking topic four the next time that I see you. If I'm going to see you Thursday and Friday, you'll take topic two test. And then the next time I see you on uh, Tuesday or Monday or Tuesday, whichever day, you'll be taking topic four. So uh, four one is about pure competition. Uh, basically pure competition. Um, I always try to tie a current product uh, into the thought process so that when I think pure competition, I think of these actual products. Uh, so pure competition, I think of an iPhone or gasoline. Because uh, when I think of gasoline, if, if my car is on empty, I just need gas. I don't care if it's Shell. I don't care if it's Exxon. I don't care if it's Thornton's. I, I don't care who it is. If I'm on empty, I, I just need gas to make my car go. Um, so I'm going to be looking for the cheapest price. And uh, if I'm sitting there and there's two gas stations and one's offering it for $2.20 and one's offering it for $2, I'm obviously going to go to the gas station that's $2. And if I'm the gas station that's offering it for $2.20, I'm not going to get any business unless I lower it down to $2 because everybody's going to go to the $2 gas station. Um, that's pure competition. That is where there's lots of people in the market selling the identical product, just like an iPhone. An iPhone is an iPhone. You're going to find the same iPhone at Walmart, at Target, at Sam's Club, at the Verizon store, at the AT&T store. It, it, it's not going to be different. It's going to be the exact same iPhone. And again, we're not talking about, you know, the different gigabytes, the different colors, things like that. We're talking about, you know, it's, it's an identical product. If you want a white iPhone with 64 gigabytes, it's going to be the same at Walmart as it is at Target, as it is at the, the Verizon store. So they're going to have the same exact product. And so what's going to end up happening is, this is pure competition and it's really going to drive prices down and uh, you're going to end up having, I'm going to go through these. You're going to end up having a lot of firms. These are characteristics of it. You're going to have many firms selling identical products. There's one product as you see here. Um, and whoever can run their company the most efficiently is going to be the one that sets the lower price and everybody else has kind of got to get to that price and be able to operate. And if, if you can't run your business efficiently and, and sell at that price, then you're gonna go bankrupt. And that's why accountants and, and managers are so important in a business because you've gotta find a way to operate on really cheap costs uh, so that you can keep your prices low. This is how Walmart uh, has been so successful and run a lot of people out of business because they can keep their prices low and run really efficiently and they're selling the same products that other people are selling, but at cheaper costs. And everybody else has to meet their prices um, or go out of business. That's why a lot of people do price matching. Um, so you can see from the chart here, barriers to entry. Barriers to entry are things that uh, can keep you from entering the market. Uh, when there's pure competition, there really aren't any barriers to entry. Anybody can enter it, um, but you have no control over prices. So I can't enter the market and say, I'm going to sell the iPhones for $2,000. Because if I do that, nobody's going to buy my iPhones. I'm going to have to set the price. I'm going to have to look around, around town, see what everybody else is selling them for, and I'm going to have to price it at that. Um, even I'm going to have to look around the country, because with the way the internet is, like if I'm in California, I might say, well, you know, uh, the cost of doing business here is so much more expensive, but with the internet, someone could, you know, go to Tennessee and, and order it over the internet and get it much cheaper. So I, I've really got to look at how people can buy it if I want to stay in business. Um, so barriers to entry, these are things that can make it difficult to enter competition. Uh, those can be startup costs. I know when I opened my business, I had about $30,000 worth of equipment that I had to buy just to open the door. 
Um, some businesses don't take much. Uh, other businesses, we'll talk about one, like a, a movie company, that would be very expensive. Um, because technology obviously is going to be more expensive. Here's the movie company. I mean, I think one of those lights and cameras, probably millions of dollars. That'd be really high startup cost, a huge barrier to entry. Um, you know, if you look here, uh, you've got tons of inputs, land labor, uh, machinery, equipment, organizational skills. Um, when you've got these, these pure competitive markets, it, it's how you put all these things together that uh, determine how efficient you're going to be able to run and how well you're going to be able to keep your prices low. And those are the people that are going to thrive in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how pricing works in these uh, purely competitive markets. So the competition, again, competition is good for us as consumers because it drives prices down. Uh, it forces suppliers to keep prices close to one another because, again, we're going to go where the price is cheaper. If, if, the, if the products are identical, we're going to go where the cheaper price is. Um, so whoever has the lower costs of running their business, they're going to set the lowest price, and everybody around them is going to have to meet that price or we're, we're not going to buy stuff from them. Um, and so that's going to drive the prices to the lowest cost and, uh, the businesses are either going to have to meet that low price or they're just going to have to stop selling that product or get out of the market altogether. So, uh, again, this is a win-win for the consumer because it drives prices down for us. Uh, not necessarily a win-win for the supplier because the supplier is going to lose profit margin. They're not going to be able to sell it for a higher profit margin. Um, so you can look at that when we're in class, those are extra credit things. Now, monopoly. Um, so let's look at characteristics of monopolies. Um, there's your, uh, vocabulary terms to study. Um, now one of the, when I think of a monopoly, I think of prescription medication. Uh, and here's an example of one. Uh, if you have all of a sudden been diagnosed with some rare and serious uh, infection, and this has actually happened to me where I've gone to the pharmacy and uh, gone to pick up the medication and, and it's like $120 and I about passed out. Um, just an FYI, if that happens to you, you do not have to accept the medication. You can call your doctor and say, I can't afford that. You got to give me something different. Um, but sometimes there's not a substitution and you got to pay for it. And like in this scenario, it's only 10 pills. So that's like $10 a pill. Um, so you have to take the medication because it's the only thing that's going to cure this infection. Um, and the reason it costs this much is because there's only one company. They have a patent on the drug and they can charge whatever they want for it. They have a monopoly. And the reason they have the patent is like we discussed in the last chapter, so they can recoup uh, the cost that they incurred for creating the drug, inventing the drug, and, and developing it. Uh, but it kind of stinks when, when you need the medication and you're having to pay $100. Um, and the, here's why. Uh, scientists believe it costs about a billion dollars to develop a new drug. Uh, and you know, when I, when I ask students, there's probably about, you know, one fourth of the class that has taken a medication one time that was very expensive and, and was not offered in a generic. I've had that happen to me. Uh, my son currently takes a medication for his asthma. that's not offered in a generic. It's, it's like a hundred dollars a month. I think if we've got six months before it's offered in generic, the patent will run out and then it'll be much cheaper. Um, and those are examples of monopolies. Um, so here are the characteristics of a monopoly. Uh, there's only one company that sells it. There's zero variety in the good, just like a pure competition. So it's, it, they're selling one product, it's identical. Uh, there's a complete barrier to entry because they're the only company allowed to sell it. Uh, but they, unlike uh, pure competition, they have complete control over the price. 
they can sell it for whatever they want. And this was an issue several years ago with EpiPens for people that have uh, food allergies or, or bee stings. Um, they, they were selling EpiPens for like seven, eight hundred dollars. And when you're talking about something that's life-saving, uh, it actually went to Congress because it's a life-saving drug and people couldn't afford it. I mean, $700 and EpiPens expire. So when you're talking about a drug that's not, you know, good for the rest of your life at $700 when it expires in a year or two, that's a lot of money. That's, that's a lot of money. Um, these are economies of scale. Uh, basically what happens is when you are a business, when you start producing a product, your average total cost per unit is going to go down. Uh, you have a lot of fixed cost. And so when you average those fixed costs over um, the number of units that you produce, your average cost per unit is going to go down. But eventually you're going to reach a point like you see on this curve where it's going to go down and that's good, but then it's going to start going back up. And you don't want to get on that curve where it starts going back up. Okay. So when you're an economy of scale, you're on that downward curve and that's a good place to be. When you start going back up, that's negative. You don't want to be going back up. And that's for the economists to, to worry about. Um, now, the government uh, does control uh, certain things. There are natural monopolies that can be created. Uh, that tends to be like your electric company, your water company. Uh, we studied that some in topic two about there's just some, uh, those market failures where it just doesn't work in the private sector. It needs to be a, a, a public good. Um, and those tend to be natural monopolies. Uh, there's really only one company you can get your electric bill from, uh, your natural gas, your water. I mean, you buy your house and, and I literally do not have a choice who I get my electricity, my water, and uh, my natural gas from. Um, so a government monopoly can also be a natural monopoly, the same thing. Um, and again, that's, that's my water bill, my gas bill, um, my electric bill. Um, you've got technological monopolies, franchises and license, industrial organizations. Um, we're going to talk about those. Here's an example of some famous patents. Um, you've got uh, an ingredient in fertilizer. Uh, the cotton gin. This was a big one, Eli Whitley, that allowed them to gin cotton faster. Um, and when he did this, this is back in 19, or, sorry, 1794. Um, he patented it, but people were able to pay him to use his cotton gin. So it wasn't like everybody rushed to him to use his cotton gin, but because he had the patent, like if I wanted to use his cotton gin, I could pay him a royalty to build his cotton gin and use it. And so he was literally making money just sitting back and doing nothing because he created it and he invented it. Um, Alexander Graham Bell patented the telephone, same thing. Edison, light bulb, we all know that. Uh, but if you look at Singer, most people know Singer sewing machines. He didn't create the sewing machine, but he patented, uh, he reinvented it. He created a faster and less expensive one. Um, and then the iPhone, I think we all knew like the iPod came out. I remember that, y'all may not. But I remember the iPod came out and you had a cell phone. So you had like one in each back pocket. And then you kept hearing, ooh, they're going to combine the two into an iPhone. And that was like a really big deal that was coming out. Um, here's another example of a government monopoly. Uh, if you've ever been to like uh, Yellowstone National Park, I've been once. Uh, they have souvenir shops and those are a kind of monopoly because the government contracts with a company to run the souvenir shops and they only allow one company in. So technically that's a monopoly. They don't just allow everybody into the park to sell stuff. Um, so again, here, like here's, here's another example. Like if you've got asthma and uh, there is one drug that like pretty much makes your asthma go away and you're living a, a normal life, uh, how much would that be worth to you? But then again, what if you can't afford it? 
there are many, many people in our country that, that are dealing with this scenario right now. Uh, cancer patients, um, diabetics. Uh, you'd be surprised how many diabetics forego their insulin or their medication because they just can't afford it. Um, I mean, it's the difference between putting food on the table for their kids or having their diabetic medication. And it, it shouldn't be something that people have to choose from. But sadly, that is, that those are, those are decisions that people in America are facing today. Um, uh, and here's one reasons why, reason why. Um, the consumer price index, this is something where we base inflation off of. Um, it's a market basket of goods that people tend to uh, purchase each year. And so we're kind of measuring inflation based on that. So if you look at the consumer price index, it hasn't gone up much. But if you look at the price of prescription drugs, you can see they've gone up a lot, a lot. Yeah. So big, huge deal. Um, now, when a company has a monopoly on a particular product, like a new drug, uh, if they produce a whole lot, you know, if they, they really overproduce, it actually can lower their marginal revenue. So they can start, start, basically what that means is maybe they produce 2 million units instead of a million they actually could be making less on that second million. Like instead of making uh, uh, an additional $10 per pill, they could be now only making $2 per pill. So it might not be worth it to make that additional million units. And then we might end up with a shortage. Um, price discrimination. Uh, this is probably not what you think, because when I think discrimination, I think like, you know, ooh, you're, you're excluding people. Um, this is completely different. Uh, this is where you're actually offering different prices to different groups. Um, we do that. We actually do this here at Beach when uh, with our lunches because we have regular price lunch, we have free and reduced, and then we are reduced, and then we have free lunches. Um, if you go to the movies, you have a child price and you have senior citizen price. Uh, I believe like amusement parks, they have child tickets and uh, senior citizen disc, uh, tickets. Um, so the, the reason you do price discrimination is uh, different customers are willing to pay different prices. And, you know, if you take the movies, for example, um, like when I was a young mom, when my kids were younger, I would like to go to the movies and I had to take my kids. I wasn't going to pay for a babysitter, but when my kids were three and four years old, they weren't going to enjoy the movie as much. Half the time they slept. Um, so it's cheaper to take them to a movie than hire a babysitter, but I didn't want to pay $10, $11. Uh, but if the child price was around $5, then it was worth it. It was cheaper than a babysitter to take them, give them a bottle and let them sleep. Um, so Yes, the price discrimination works there. Um, and, you know, and again, I'm probably going to buy them popcorn to keep them quiet and buy them a drink. Um, so they're going to get money off me. Um, and again, senior citizens probably not going to pay the $10 because they're on fixed uh, income. So that's going to get them in. So that's where uh, price discrimination is going to happen. Um, they're going to set different price for different customers. Uh, but they have to be able to, to divide them into different groups. Um, and so here's things that have to occur in order to be able to do this price discrimination. Uh, you have to have significant market power. You have to. Um, you have to have some control over the price. Otherwise, it's not going to work. You've got to be able to divide them into distinct customer groups. Uh, if you can't do that, that's not going to work. And it's got to be something that's difficult to resell. Again, like a child ticket to an amusement park, like I can't buy it and go in, yeah, I'm 11 years old. They're going to go, ha ha, yeah, no, you're not. Might be 16, 18, hmm, yeah, ha ha, I know. Um, but again, you know, I, I'm an 80-year-old woman. Yeah, I'm not going to pass as that either. Um, so it's got to be something difficult to resell. So... All right, let's get into 4.3. Ha ha, we're cruising right along. Uh, monopolistic competition in oligopolies. Whoo, that's a mouthful. Uh, greatest example of monopolistic competition is exactly what you see right there. 
jeans. Jeans or jeans? I'm wearing jeans right now. It's Wednesday. Y'all aren't here. I can wear jeans. Um, jeans. Jeans are jeans. There are black jeans. There are white jeans. There's dark. There are uh, acid wash. Those are coming back. Can't believe it. Uh, there are light jeans, uh, medium wash jeans. There's jeans with holes, jeans with bling, jeans that are bell bottom, jeans that are boot cut, jeans that are, are skinny jeans, tight jeans. They're jeans. But there's something that differentiates them. That's monopolistic competition. Uh, polos, golf shirts. Uh, some golf shirts have the alligator for Izod. They have the horse for polo. They have the whale for, I don't even remember what that company is. Um, you know, uh, pink has the dog, whatever. Uh, all the different labels, they put their label on it. That differentiates them. Uh, that's monopolistic competition. T-shirts, I'm wearing a T-shirt right now. The color differentiates it. The design on it differentiates it. Um, that's exactly what monopolistic competition is, is they are similar products, but there's something that differentiates it from the other. Um, so jeans are a great example. Here's orange juice. Me, orange juice has to be pulp free. I cannot do pulp. I don't like pulp. If you have a calcium deficiency, you're probably going to pick the one with calcium. Mm. If you like it sweeter, you probably want a little more sugar in it. I don't know. If you're diabetic, you want one that doesn't have extra sugar. Um, Non-price competition. There is a way to compete uh, that has nothing to do with price. Um, some people like really, really nice buildings. They don't want something that's, that's falling down. Uh, I know me, my husband and I are real big, like when we go to the beach. Uh, we want to find that hole-in-the-wall restaurant that looks like it's falling apart because uh, usually that's some of the best food or like the, the barbecue joint that you drive by and it looks like it's a shanty, like it's a shack. And sometimes that's the best barbecue you've ever eaten in your life. Um, but there are some people that would look at the building and go, ooh, I'm never going in there. Um, Yokohama's locally. I actually drove by that place uh, for years and thought, is that even open? But amazing food in there. Really, really amazing food and they have great prices because it's not this big, fancy, expensive building. Um, Non-price competition. Uh, some people build really fancy buildings because some people will uh, go for that stuff. Uh, Chick-fil-A, another example. Chick-fil-A has excellent customer service. Even though their lines are three miles long, people will still go there because they know they're getting excellent customer service. Uh, here's the one. Uh, here's Rodeo Drive, Beverly Hills. A lot of people want to go there just so they can say, I shopped on Rodeo Drive. Ooh. Or, you know, I, I got my stuff at Tiffany's. Mm. Okay. You know, whatever floats your boat, it's great. Um, prices, outputs, and profits. Uh, these are things that affect monopolistic competition. Uh, here are the differences between monopolistic competition and pure competition. You can see both of them have many firms. Uh, monopolistic competition, there's some variety to the goods. So like jeans, I can have the bling all over the pockets and down my legs, or they can be plain. Uh, pure competition is a identical products. It's like my Diet Dr. Pepper here. It doesn't matter where I go in the store, it's the same Diet Dr. Pepper. Uh, monopolistic competition. There's low barriers to entry. I mean, there are some, but pretty much anybody can enter. Pure competition, anybody can enter. There's, there's none. Uh, monopolistic competition. I do have a little control over the price. Uh, because if I put an alligator on my shirt or I, I put a name brand on there, then I might say, ooh, mine's better because I have an alligator on there, so I can charge a little more. Um, but, you know, if it's Diet Dr. Pepper and everybody's selling it for $1.79, I kind of have to sell it for $1.79. Um, so, yeah. Um, now here, this is something like, you know, if I have a perfume and I've got Liz Taylor, 
uh, endorsing it, which she was really big child actress. Uh, yeah. Um, when we have celebrities endorse things like Michael Jordan for the, you know, the Air Jordan shoes are still hugely popular. Um, that all of a sudden makes them worth more money um, because the celebrity says, you know, wear my perfume or, you know, Air Jordans are going to make you jump higher. Um, it does. It, 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 that all of a sudden makes them more. Now, an oligopoly. Examples for this would be um, shoes, tennis shoes, and uh, gaming systems. Because if I asked you to think of who are the big players in the tennis shoe market, you're probably going to say Nike, Adidas, um, somebody has said Vans. I, I didn't think of them as tennis shoes, uh, but that's probably showing my age. Um, yeah, I can come up with several. Nike, Under Armour, uh, well, they're probably not big, big players. Um, I did Adidas, uh, uh, Asics, y'all probably don't do that. Um, but I can come up with ton. Reebok, Nike, Adidas, uh, Converse, New Balance, Saucony, um, and then there's a whole bunch of other ones. Like, I mean, I can name them for days. But there's a couple of really big ones that dominate. Nike, obviously. Um, that's an oligopoly. If we look at gaming systems, there's many out there, but there's two really big players, PS, PlayStation, and Xbox. Um, so those large firms uh, produce 70 to 80% of the output. That makes it an oligopoly. Um, if we look at the music industry, uh, same thing. There's lots and lots of record labels out there. I mean, we're in Nashville, we know that. Um, but, you know, you've got the big three out there. you got Universal, Sony, and Warner Music. Um, but there's a lot of others. There's a lot of a little mom and pops out there, too. Uh, here's the video gaming. Yeah, oligopoly. Y'all can look at those, so maybe you get some stamps. Um, and then let's look at the last one in topic four, government regulation. Um, so... Uh, you have choices in what you want to do. Uh, probably the biggest one right now that you deal with is your cell phone plan. Are you Verizon? Are you AT&T? Are you Sprint? Um, your cable and internet. Um, Congress in 2007 did pass a law that uh, no company should have more than 30% of the cable market. Um, this was was really really interesting because if you look at cable television now we're talking cable television is actually a cable going into your home like cabled television well all there is is comcast so if you're looking at the cable television market comcast has a monopoly and it has more than 30 percent of the market um so this was a ruling against comcast um and Comcast fought this and won because their argument is, yes, they have more than 30% of the cable TV market, but they're competing against satellite TV. So you can't just limit it to cable TV. You have to limit it to uh, in-home uh, uh, home TV service because they don't have more than 30% of the home TV service market. And so they ended up uh, removing that 30% limit because again, a lot of people have satellite TV. Uh, you've now got the AT&T U-verse. Uh, there's so many. Now we've got Netflix, we've got Hulu, we've got so many other options besides just cable TV. So, um, We have uh, cable TV companies, uh, you know, Comcast kind of is a monopoly, but it's not our only option. It's just a monopoly as far as cable TV. Um, here is an ad protesting uh, when Time Warner Cable, it blocked a major network from its company. Uh, David Letterman, I think that was CBS. Because uh, they come into an agreement like uh, they will pay 
uh, CBS will pay them or something. There's, there's a monetary agreement they couldn't come to. So they said, well, we just won't offer CBS in our service. So CBS is pretty much saying you need to call the cable company and say you want them or you're going to drop, drop their service. Uh, these are antitrust policies. Uh, you've probably studied this Sherman Antitrust Act in uh, your social studies class, your history classes. Um, but uh, this is where they tried to make sure that uh, companies are not doing things illegally. Uh, it's like in 1911, uh, Supreme Court broke up the American Tobacco Company and Standard Oil Trust uh, monopolies. Um, 1950, they passed the uh, Seller uh, Kefauver Act so that mergers wouldn't happen that could create monopolies and hurt competitions. Uh, 1982, I remember this one, um, AT&T uh, was a monopoly and they broke up into the seven regional Bell South companies. Um, and then AT&T uh, retained its monopoly on, on the long distance. Uh, you used to have to pay for long distance calls. Uh, 2001, there was a lawsuit with Microsoft. Uh, so yeah, the, the government does intervene to make sure that somebody's not out there just price gouging us. Uh, here's where you can see AT&T was broken up, 1984. Um, I have actually had service for Bell South and Southwestern Bell. Uh, lived in Texas for a while, not had any of the others. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us do not have home phone service anymore. Uh, most of us are, are, have cut the cord and we're cell phone only. Um, now, sometimes the government will step in and regulate industries and then they can turn around and deregulate industries because uh, regulation can be beneficial and, and just like anything, uh, the government can come in and, and regulate something and then it can turn around and be harmful. Um, so then they'll need to deregulate. So in the 70s and 80s, they did some regulation uh, and then they figured out that it was starting to reduce competition. So they started to deregulate uh, several industries. Um, so they were, they were no longer deciding what role the companies were playing in the market. Um, so again, we want regulation and deregulation to uh, increase competition. And both of them can do that if they're done correctly. But both of them can also backfire and decrease competition. So they have to be watched. They really have to watch. Um, and, and it's kind of like uh, the unemployment right now. We've been giving people an extra $600 with COVID. And you can use that as a great example. That has been very beneficial for people to help them out because 275 a week is not good. Uh, it, it's been excellent. But it can also backfire because if you're getting 875 a week, can it backfire and incentivize people not to go back to work if they're making more money? Yes, it, it can. So again, you have to watch things closely to make sure that when it gets to a point, it's no longer doing good that you deregulate things. Uh, time to change classes. Woo! Um, so yeah, when you regulate things, you might enforce antitrust laws, break up monopolies challenge business practices, block mergers. Uh, but when you deregulate, you might, you're pretty much just reversing all the regulations, you're, you're making them go away. You might eliminate any price controls uh, that might allow prices to fall. Uh, and you might eliminate any barriers to entry. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you've got huge taxes on it, um, things like that. Uh, trucking industry. Now, I know this one really well because this is the industry my father was in all his life. Uh, there were lots of regulations on the trucking industry. Um, and, and again, the trucking industry, if, if you have anything, you need to thank a trucker um, because they are the ones that keep our country going. They bring all the food and supplies to all the businesses that you have. Um, and again, deregulation, lower barriers to, in, uh, to the 
industry. Um, owner operators, that's a trucker that owns his own uh, uh, cab, 18 uh, wheeler, um, and they're called owner operators. Mm -hmm. uh, deregulation of the airline industry. Uh, we fly much cheaper now than we did 20 years ago. Uh, and you can look at it here in this graph. Um, back in 1980, it was $450, $500 for, for a, a flight. And I mean, I have flown for 60 bucks sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, look at that. The average price per ticket, that's because we deregulated the airline industry. <laughs> and there you go. So use that to help study. Um, I'm going to do another video for studying for the test. So happy topic four.